So there are 37 volcanoes in Guatemala, only three of them are active. I'm gonna walk through the process of showing you guys uh, how I photographed, where I hiked, the gear that I used, how long it took, um, and basically some behind the scenes of the photos that I've taken. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, it's Kendrick from freedomofphotography.com. It's the website and the channel that I've put together to share my travel experiences and photography experiences from all over the world and help you get started in your travel and photography journeys. And today we will be discussing my process for photographing volcanoes in Guatemala. So after I finished working on a project in Australia, I decided to go to Central America and Guatemala to photograph the volcanoes. So I chose Guatemala because of all the good outdoor activities and options and the volcanoes. And I knew it would be a good time that I could have photographing and kind of chilling out before my next project starts. So there are 37 volcanoes in Guatemala. Only three of them are active and only two of them erupt lava and one erupts ash and smoke basically. So out of the two, you have Acatenango and you have Pacaya. Acatenango is, actually you climb Acatenango and Fuego is the actual volcano that erupts. Another good thing about Guatemala is the prices are very inexpensive. I was able to get an Airbnb in Shayla for $10 a night. Two bedroom, two bath, kitchen, Wi-Fi, whole house for $10 a night, $50 a week discount. So that's another reason why I chose to spend some time in Guatemala since um, it's, you just really can't beat those prices. So the first volcano I decided to hike and photograph was Pacaya. Uh, it's one of the shorter hikes. It's about an hour to the top. It's about an hour and a half outside of Antigua, a little over an hour outside of Antigua. Antigua is probably gonna be your base. So if you're spending any time in Guatemala, outside of Guatemala City, you have Antigua, and it's a much better place to hang out than Guatemala City. So you're in Antigua, drive about an hour outside of Antigua, and you have Pacaya. You can climb up the mountain, you can have a guide, you can do it alone. They have horses in case you don't want to haul your gear up there. I think I did it in like 50 minutes. Uh, most people, it takes about an hour, or maybe an hour and 10 minutes to get to the top, but I was trying to get up there and get set up before the sunset uh, crept up on me. So I was kind of moving it a little bit. So at Pacaya Volcano, they it's not a lot of uh, erupting, like violent eruptions from the volcano. It's more of a oozing lava down the side, so you can get a lot closer to it than you can like uh, Fuego and a thing like that. And you can roast marshmallows. Uh, that you can do s'mores and do all that stuff. I wasn't really into that because I came here to photograph, so I was really trying to find the best angles for the best photography. So I do have some footage from when I was at Pacaya Volcano where I was explaining what I was doing in my shooting and everything, and we can check this out, and I'll come back and discuss it a little bit. It's the Pacaya Volcano, about an hour outside of Antigua, Guatemala out here doing some shooting. This is what we're shooting right here. Little three foot volcano, you can see it better when the sunset go down. I'm just waiting for the sun to go down, or at least the sunset light to get a little bit better. We out here above the clouds, as you can see. It took us about an hour to hike up here. <clears throat> so this is the three for, uh, this is volcano, uh, the Agua. This is the Fuego to the left. And I forget what the one in the middle is. First shot, I'm gonna try to get three shots out of this location. One here, one over there, and there was another one uh, on the way up. I'm gonna try to get on the way down when the um, light is better, when we go back down. It's a setup today, we're shooting a 5D Mark III, 70 to 200, 2.8 Mark II telephoto lens on a uh, Gitso 3541 Mountaineer tripod and ball head. And um, this is it. Just waiting on the sun to go down, just chilling. I got the uh, 16 to 35 on deck in case I want to go wide. Probably go wide over there on that one. 
I'm going long right here, and then I go wide when the sun is more cooperative. Probably going to shoot with the, um, yeah. probably going to shoot with the big stopper, a Lee big stopper, 10 stop lens, since it's so, um, Lee filters, we got the 10 stop lens, because it's so bright. So basically, I'm throwing some shades over my camera. I've been at the beach and got sand all in it. But you put this over the lens and it's gonna make it 10, about 10 stops darker. And if you can see, look through it, you can't even see it. There's a reflection of me. So there you go. Just out here working. Another day at the office. So as I said in the video, I was using the Getso 3541L Mountaineer tripod. Uh, it was good for the heights and getting over all of the brush and the sea, getting good uh, views of the volcano. It can support the weight of the 5D. Uh, I think this was my Mark III before I got the Mark IV and the 70 to 200 2.8, which is a pretty sturdy setup and the Getso can handle it no problem. So looking back on it in hindsight, I probably would have brought my 7D Mark I because it's a 1.6 ASPC aspect ratio. So basically, if it's a 70 to 200 lens, it increases it to a 112 to 320 millimeter lens just by having a crop sensor camera. So some are 1.4, some are 1.6. The 7D Mark I is 1.6X. So to get that, you multiply it to 70 to 200 lens you multiply that by 1.6 and that will give you 112 millimeter to 320 millimeter, millimeter. And it just would have gave you a tighter focus, a more um, zoomed in focus without actually having a longer focal length. You're just using a different size sensor on the camera. But with the weight and the space of hiking up the volcano, I figured the 5D was good enough. So I didn't really decide to bring the 70. One of the favorite things that I do like about using the 70 to 200 for landscapes is the fact that it can compress landscapes in the distance. So you can see on some of these photos, the volcanoes in the distance. If you use a wide angle, then it'll kind of get lost in the rest of the landscape and you won't be as surgically tuned in on your subject as you would if you had a 70 to 200. Think of the uh, like a 16 or 35 that's more of a shotgun approach. If you have a 70 to 200, it's more of a sniper approach. And it's zoomed in so people don't really think to use it for a landscape. They think big, wide open areas, but the 70 to 200 is one of my favorite lenses for landscape. It's, I use it as much as I can. It really compresses the image and keeps it tight and centered so that you can really concentrate your eyes on the subject of the photo or your composition. With this, I also use one of my favorite accessories for photography, which is the Lee Big Stop filter. Uh, I put a link in the description. They have two. They released, uh, not too long ago, they released one that has less, uh, I call it blueiness, uh, but sometimes the blue from the first edition is beneficial to your photography. The one I have now is a little bit more neutral uh, colored in the filter. It's not so cool as the blue, but they both are very good. Link is in the description. So the 10 stop is really good for those super bright conditions where you still want to get uh, some nice shots during the daytime or when the sun is a little harsh. You're basically just putting 10 uh, stops of light over the lens, just like shade, just like I explained in the video. I don't want to repeat myself, but it's uh, a good thing to have in your bag because it gives different effects, different cloud motions, different water, waterfalls, rivers, things like that. So it's good to just keep it in your bag and use it uh, if you have the time. The more you use it, you'll figure out different tricks and techniques to get the maximum use out of it. So I highly recommend the Lee Big Stop Filter, the 10 Stop Filter. I'm not sponsored or financed in any way by Lee Stop Filters. I just like them. They're the best that I've used. So I'm um, just letting you know what my setup is. You can find a link in the description. So another place that I got some good photographs in Guatemala was around Lake Adelon. Anywhere around there, you're pretty much good for all types of different uh, compositions and angles from all the volcanoes with the lake. So it's a good place to check out. 
I went to San Pedro, La Laguna, and um, it's about two and a half hours outside of Antigua. The bus comes around super early in the morning so you can catch the sunsets. So they come around at like, I forget, like three or four o'clock and they pick you up and you drive maybe uh, less than an hour there and it's about less than an hour. Hike to the top, bring your headlamps. You're gonna need your headlamps. Keep that in your bag anyway. That's one of the things that you should keep in your bag. Hit me up in the comments and let me know if you want me to do a video about what I keep in my bag and what you should keep in your bag. It gets kind of cliche on the YouTube channels, what's in my bag, but people keep asking me about it, inbox me, what lens do you have, what camera do you use, what accessories do you use. I might let you know if people care about it as much, if not, forget about it. So you start hiking uh, before the sun comes up, it's super dark, it's pretty steep hike in my opinion if you have uh, mobility issues that may not be the best option for you but if you normal hikes no problem then you shouldn't have any issue so we'll get to the top you can see um, some of these photos how the sun is just rising up from the top uh, of Lake Adelon and looking down in the distance you can still see some of the stars some of the blues coming in and for this one, I definitely had to get so tripod again because I needed to get over this brush. You can't see it on this photo, but kind of above the cloud, above the um, stand where I was, where we hiked up to, there was a lot of tall brushes and it was good to have the extension on the get so to look over and get clean shots of the lake and the volcano. I do not recommend using your extension too much, especially if it's windy, if you have a heavy setup, but sometimes it comes in handy to get that extra height to get the shot that you need. On this one again, I had the 70 to 200 2.8 uh, Canon telephoto lens to get the distance, kind of bring the distance in a little bit with the sun rising in the background and the stars still aligned with the uh, volcanoes. It's all just came together. And I got some wide angle shots also, you can see those here, but I also uh, really was happy to get the 70 to 200 shot. The body I used on this one again was the Canon 5D Mark III. It's good for the low light, it's good for the uh, full frame, it's a full frame camera so you get the full sensor use. Even though you're probably going to crop it a little bit, it's still nice to have the more wider frame so you can catch a lot of the foreground, the lake, and the volcanoes in the back. So shout out to the 5D for coming in handy again. Had the 70 on me, just chose not to bring it because I try to think about weight and uh, space and things like that. So I try to limit. The 5D is more versatile than the 70. And I know a lot of cameras now are moving toward mirrorless uh, away from DSLR. I still like DSLR. I may do a video about why I prefer DSLR being more heavier and bulkier and more of a process to use. I like it that way. I did manage to get some good wide angle shots with the 16 to 35 2.8. Wonderful low light camera and lens combination. It really worked with capturing the brightness of the sun coming up but still keeping the lows of the blacks and the blues from uh, the low light before the sun comes up. So it's a good balanced lens, not too much um, vignetting or, or any negative effects from being open all the way at 16 millimeters. So this is the Mark II. My Mark I got stolen in Ecuador. Whole nother video I'll talk about maybe one day. But when I replaced it, I got this Mark II and I think it's for the better because it does work. Um, I can see the difference between the 16 and 35 Mark I and Mark II. So the next spot I hit was Parque Chirac Somogo. It's one of the best national parks in Guatemala, one of the largest national parks. In my view, it's the best place to see the best views of the best volcanoes. It's about two or two and a half hours west of Antigua and I had the whole place to myself. They was doing some construction, but I met a guy that just so happened to know the people that was doing the construction there and I told him I wanted to do some photography. He suggested that I go there and they let me in. I stayed there by myself, completely by myself. I had to bring my own snacks and water and supplies and blankets and stuff to sleep in one of the conference halls that they were building, but I had running water and um, cell phone signal, so it wasn't that bad, it didn't have Wi-Fi, but uh, this is when they were doing construction on the park and no one was allowed in, and I could go all around the park by myself. I was completely there by myself, so I had free roam of the whole park, 
and it was it was pretty cool. I was really lucky to find someone that just so happened to know um, what was going on and, and how to help me get in there. So that goes back to what I was saying in my other videos about just open your mouth and talking and letting people know your intentions because I don't think I could have Googled that or hired a um, tour company to take me there because they just would have said, oh, it's closed. But I don't even know where I met this dude. I, I think it was a taxi driver maybe. Normally that's what it is. I'm practicing my Spanish. So I talked to them and luckily this one worked out in my favor. So as far as gear for these shots, I used a combination of a 16 to 35 and a 70 to 200. So you can see these shots were more from the 16 to 35 wide angle. You can get a lot of the far off distance. I got the volcanoes. I got a little bit of the lake. I got the sky. You can see the volcanoes erupting in the background. That's pretty cool that I was able to capture that from such a good distance. I don't know the exact distance I was away from these eruptions, but it was a lot. So um, it's just good to see that that night was dark. I was away from a lot of the light, so a lot of the stars um, was able to come through in the photographs. You can see the volcano on the right. There's one on the left. It's a uh, Pacaya volcano on the left, Fuego volcano on the right. But the left Pacaya volcano has a little small beam of light. You can barely see it, but that is the volcano uh, erupting. So I was able to capture a dual volcano eruption. This is late at night at Parque Chirac Samolo. I still don't know if I'm saying it right, uh, but I'm very happy with these photographs. So these are with the 70 to 200. You can see the sun coming up, capturing the beautiful colors. But this is not a lot of heavy Photoshop photos. It really does look like this. I mean, the colors are coming in wonderfully. The sun is rising. I was able to zoom in with the 70 to 200 and really get a nice composition of the little bit of the lake, the volcanoes, and the colors coming in from the sunrise in the back. Very happy with these photos. So the 5D Mark III really worked well in these low light conditions. Of course, that's what it's known for. Uh, to help capture the lights down at the bottom of the volcano from the little villages and cities. Uh, capture the volcano exploded way in the distance and I was able to capture a little bit of the stars. The stars are so clear and crisp up there, it's like you can reach out and touch them. And I was able to get all of that with the low light. It was super dark, way darker than it looked in this photo. So uh, shout out to the 5D. It got famous from being uh, one of the low light leaders in the industry, so here it's just proven it's worth, always uh, been good to me, never let me down. So after warming up with the first few volcanoes at a national park, I figured it was time to hit the granddaddy of them all, the big boy Akatenango volcano. This was about a four to five hour hike up to the top, uh, super vertical, super sandy, take two steps forward, slide one step back. So it was really taxing on the legs and the hips and the calves, but it was so worth it to get to the top. I, this is by far one of the more strenuous hikes that I've been on. I haven't been on a whole, whole lot, but I've been on my share, and I think this was definitely toward the top of the list as far as uh, intensity. But once you get to the top, the last 30 minutes, you're just hiking kind of horizontally uh, to get to the campsite. I booked it with one of the local, uh, I forget the exact name of the one uh, that I went with in town, but it was with one of the hostels and uh, you can pay $25 to have them bring your stuff on a porter. That's what I did eventually. So I was trying to carry myself, uh, all of my camera gear and my clothes, and you have to bring water to share, and there's a list of stuff you have to bring up with you. So halfway through, I just decided to give it to one of the porters so that they can do it because I just didn't feel like doing it. And once I did that, I enjoyed the hike very much. So that is one thing I can recommend. Pay the money to have the porters take your stuff up. Don't try to be a tough guy or try to enhance the, I'm gonna do it all by myself spirit and just know you're gonna be miserable, you're gonna be tired, your back is gonna be aching. Just give it to the guys that's born to do this day in and day out is what they do. Let them take it, pay the money. I still had to pay the full $25 um, before, I mean, through the middle of the hike as if I had gave it to them from the beginning. Once I did free myself of all of my gear, I was much more in a better position to enjoy the hike and that's what I did. On this hike, I had the same setup, the 5D Mark III, 70 to 200, 16 to 35. That's the best 
setup that I have for landscape that I found. Um, it's I haven't found a combination that uh, works better than that. It's my favorite, it may be better, but uh, this is the one that I found. So the 5D body, 70 to 200, 16 to 35 lens are basically what I use for most of my landscape shots. And I only shoot Canon. Not saying they're the best or the only one available, but that's what I use, that's what I prefer, that's what I'm comfortable with. Something I did not expect before I started to shoot these volcanoes, especially Alcatenango, was how was I gonna focus in low light? I didn't even think about it. So when I got up there, it was dark. There was no light, none. No light at all to focus. And so when the sun is going down and you're getting sunsets, then you have some light where you don't have to really worry about focusing too much. But when it's pitch black, super dark, how are you gonna focus? So I didn't think about this. I got up there, I didn't panic, but I kinda got a little worried. Like I came all the way up here and I can't even focus my camera. So something that I figured out was I had to use the light from the eruptions. I was about three kilometers at the time from uh, Fuego Volcano. So you hike up Acatenango and you photograph Fuego. It's about three kilometers away and it would have periodic and sporadic eruptions. The problem is they weren't uh, very, um, you couldn't know the timing of them. They weren't the same spacing in between each eruption every time. In between eruptions, it may be 10 seconds, it may be an hour, it may be two minutes, it may be 30 minutes, it may be 30 seconds, it may be 40 minutes, it may be two minutes, it may be 10 minutes, you have no idea. It just, it just does it whenever it does it. So I had to sacrifice some eruptions, even if they were nice, bright, beautiful eruptions, I would have to use the light from those eruptions to focus my camera. So I would get about in the general area where I thought the volcano and the composition that I wanted would be and then I would have to wait for the eruption, just sit there like a cat, like reflexes, waiting for the erupt, then it erupt, and I have like 20 to 30 seconds, no, probably not that long, probably 10 to 20 seconds before, the, from the eruption, depending on how violent it was, from the eruption to where it went dark again, that's how long I had to find my composition, get my focus and do everything like that. So eruption would come up, I would, okay, I'm off a little bit. I would line up my composition, get it focused in, in, in view, turn it on manual focus and just wait for the next eruption before I would capture it. So um, I couldn't, I didn't have time to set the composition, auto -fo uh, focus it, and capture the composition at the same time. So I would sacrifice one eruption to get my composition and my lighting and my focus so that I can capture the next eruption. And the next eruption that I was able to capture, I got this photo right here. And this is one of my favorite photos that I've had because I almost didn't capture it because I didn't know how to focus it. And I'm very happy with it because it's very much in focus. It's well lit. It's not fuzzy at all. And I did that with no light to pre-auto focus it other than the eruption itself. So I'm very proud of one of those photos. All of these photos you can see it's just different stages of the volcano erupting. Uh, you can see the bright ones, you can see the dim ones, sometimes it'll be more smoke. You can see the cloud line right there. So like above the clouds you have, it's the light is more crisp and it's colder and it's more cleaner. Below the cloud line, you have the clouds, you have the pollution, the fog, so you can see where it separates right here. We were actually above the cloud line, so the photography was so clear, not a lot of dust and particulates in the air, so it really made for much better photography. We had tents we slept in, it may have been six people to a tent, they were pretty big tents. They uh, had cots in them, they were comfortable. I had clothes, it was cold up there, but you bring enough clothes and jackets and pants and socks with you then you don't really worry about it. They had toilets, like actual toilets that you could use up there so you didn't have to go like a bear in the woods or anything, like you still had your functioning toilets. Not everybody had those, so when you do 
book your uh, reservation, be sure to be with a company that has access to uh, facing the Acatenango, uh, facing the Fuego Volcano, and that has access to toilets, because not all of the tour guides have the same uh, campsites. They have different ones, so you want to make sure that you uh, find one that has all of the needs that you're going to need to make it more comfortable. So included with your booking, they're going to have food and um, you're going to have to bring your portion of the water for the cooking and everything. But you can see us here sitting around the campfire enjoying the meal, just looking at the volcanoes in the background, talking to other people. It's a good time to relax and recoup from the hike. Um, I think it was Canadians, French, a couple of Danish guys. Uh, I was an American, may have been another American, so it's a good mix of people. And you just sit around at the campfire talking about your different journeys overlooking the volcano. It's pretty cool, really. So as far as the tripod that I use when I photograph in Akatenango, I had to switch and go with the tripod that I got out of the camera store in Antigua because the 3541L Mountaineer Gitzo that I was using, I failed to do proper maintenance on it after a few times shooting on the beach you get sand and seawater and salt all in the inner working and castings of your screws or the tripod and if you don't wash it and clean it and keep it properly maintained after that then it's going to cause degradation and brittle and drying and cracking on the inside of the screws for the uh, legs and it's going to start falling apart so i had to send it back to the united states to the factory to get it back cleaned up and maintained and get everything fixed during that time I happened to go into the last camera store in Antigua that was still open and had the tripod that was big enough to hold my gear and I got the uh, Manfrotto, it was a 190 Go Manfrotto. It wasn't as tall as my Gitzo with the legs fully extended, but with the center column up, I was able to get that extra clearance that I needed without it being um, too high center of gravity. So you just wake up the next morning, you head back down, it's about an hour and a half. Uh, hike back down, not gonna lie, going down is a little rough. Anybody that hikes knows that uh, going down sometimes is worse than coming up. It's really steep. I took a dive, head over heels, ate it a little bit. Um, it sounds crazy, but it's best to walk backwards going down. So Guatemala, very good decision to come here. I'm very happy with it. I got some good uh, photographs from the National Park, the Indian Nose, to uh, everywhere, uh, Pacaya, Acatenango. It was a very good time. Uh, I also got to see other places outside of the volcanoes. I got to see uh, Simuk Champe with the tiered waterfalls. I got to see uh, Tikal up, up north of uh, the country in, near Flores. You can see all the excavated Mayan ruins and the whole civilization that they unearthed. And it's real cool. You can go up there and check that out. So you can see the blog form of this video on my website freedomofphotography.com slash storytime and you can see as I walk along one step same information it's just in blog form be sure to check out and see all of my portfolios from all of my travels freedomofphotography.com be sure to like share subscribe to the channel if you know anyone that's into photography or trying to get into photography travel photography or any type of traveling in general with no photography share the channel let them know subscribe check out the website that's what i'm here for that's what this channel is for i've been all over the world and all over many remote places and i can try to bring that to you through my website and through my uh youtube channel so be sure to hang around if you want to see and hear about all of my crazy adventures of course t-shirts freedomofphotographer.com logo all shapes sizes colors flavors uh any other shirts that you see me wearing on the channel where I do uh, my talks and my interviews, you can get off my website, support the channel, support the travels, so I continue to bring you content uh, that I think can help in your life journeys, and you can apply them to photography and to traveling. Thanks for sticking with me this long. Thanks for the support. Peace.